Hey everybody, this is Sam, uh, coming at you before the episode to talk to you about Patreon. Yes, that's right, Patreon. This episode is brought to you by the letter P, and P stands for Patreon. So go to uh, patreon.com slash Metal Gear Mondays to donate um, if you feel like you would like to donate money to our cause. Um, as little as $1 is going to get you cool stuff. We have a Discord now where um, you can come in and talk to us and have a good time and chat with other fans of the podcast who also donate at least a dollar a month, and everybody gets that. So that's like a minimum guaranteed shit. And hey guys, this is Alessio jumping in really quickly with an update for our patrons. One, thank you. Two... We are now opening our special episode number 100 trivia uh, auditions to all patrons of all tiers, not just $10 and $5. Um, So be sure to send in an audition video uh, to contact at MetalGearMondays.com, letting us know why you think you should be one of our three trivia contestants on episode number 100. Fun prizes await all. Anyway, check that out and enjoy the episode. Ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another episode of Metal Gear Mondays, the Games Club style podcast where we cover all things Metal Gear from top to bottom, left to right, inside and out in pseudo-historical recreational order. As always, I'm your host, Alessia Summerfield, and this week I'm joined by Sam Wright. Ah, you went the traditional route. Hi, I'm making fun of you like you told me not to. Oh, no. I didn't hear that word. Blah, 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 and we're joined blah, blah. by very special guest, other James, James Meadows. Nice to be on the show. Thank you for uh, having me here. Friend and listener. Friend, go way back friend. James and I have been friends since the eighth grade for me, ninth grade for James. I'm uh, about 90% certain that our first conversation uh, centered around Metal Gear Solid. So it's uh, yes. kind of it's kind of interesting to me that uh, everything has come full circle. It was because of you, James. Um, <laughs> no, it was all because of you. Oh no, uh, friend, <laughs> friend, time. patriot, foe. Oh no, no. friend mm. or foe? <laughs> um, friend or foe? My hand. No, no. <laughs> oh, I can I just say the crowning achievement of this interview is I got to play the my hand clip for Jeremy Blaustein. <laughs> How did he feel about that? Uh, he was like, oh, fusion, no, his, but also a boner. His response was, oh, no, that's a direct translation. You're right. Nice. That That is a direct translation. <laughs> that it was, is for it was, sure a direct translation. Very good. Love that. It's very good. Uh, but yeah, so that's what we're doing today. This episode, we're talking to Jeremy Blaustein. Uh, we being me, but we all wanted to hop on the mics for the intro outro. James happened to be in town, and we figured, why the hell not? You know, Alessio graciously uh, allowed me to sneak a couple questions in on a a piece of paper, and uh, I feel that um, we managed to uh, break new ground um, and get into territory that none of the other podcasts that I've uh, heard Mr. Blaustein on uh, cover. So, uh, you know, if you're familiar with his body of work or with other podcasts that have uh, interviewed him, you're uh, in for a real treat because he uh, definitely broke some new territory, and it's very entertaining. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed talking to Jeremy. Um, I didn't like shame James in the corner and tell him like he couldn't be involved. Uh, I, I got one <laughs> sheet of 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 index paper. Yeah, I handed it to him and I said, "You better so, fit you can, it all can, on here, motherfucker." Yeah, and you can use it on the test if you can fit it all on one side. I, I did the best I could with with the materials I was given. I, I had to write in my blood. Oh no! And and I was very dehydrated, so there wasn't much of that. Yeah, I just gave him a stick, and mm-hmm. I was like, "You make this work." I also had to hose him down from time to time just to keep him quiet. But it writes the yeah. questions down, or else it gets the hose. Oh again. no! <laughs> no, it was more of a situation of James just having to be in town. Um, the Jeremy, so. Unlike previous interviews on the show where we were kind of very formal about it, Jeremy had specifically, and I just want to get this out at the top of this, uh, we reached out to Jeremy. I think we connected over email. I emailed his um, translation company, Dragon Baby. Um, It's based out of Japan. Uh, Jeremy lives in Japan. Which is like, what a a great name. (laughs) Right, right, right. Um, First of all. Just imagining like a little (laughs) Dragonite just flapping around, but obviously it couldn't be a Dragonite because, you know, copyright. There's a cute little icon on the website. Um, but J- but Jay Blau at, at Jay Blau on Twitter. Um, okay, 
we're we're there now, are we? Yeah, we're we're on nickname terms now. Um, yeah, he oh, called okay. me Alessio Chan, so that's cool. Um, <gasps> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm, I feel like I'm doing a disservice to everything we talked about in the interview by being goofy about it. So I apologize. But uh, Jeremy um, responded to the email, said that he would be interested, but he didn't want to just dedicate a whole interview to talking about Metal Gear because he felt like that had been done to death agreeing with him i was like well hey would you be willing to come on and just kind of talk about your career and like your life and um i could ask you questions about being a translator and he was like oh that sounds interesting like okay as long as we keep it informal um let's do it and Mm -hmm. since it was just kind of he and i at the the onset i didn't want to make it weird by bringing a bunch of people on yeah so yeah, hence why I was not on the uh, since why was hence why the Sam and Alessio love fest has not continued for this particular one. Well, I mean, but, you, you could tell they had really good chemistry, and you know, I, I felt like I was just you know sitting in the corner watching, <laughs> you know, because that's you know that's, that's what I like to do. That's good. Oh, it's always no. it's always good to have good uh, good chemistry with people. I I I'm, I'm glad that. I, I actually wasn't on the episode because I feel like I probably would have had like more like good algebra with him. So I'm. Oh no. I like it. Well, that's mathematical. I'm not. I'm not sorry about that one. I'm not. Jeez. Um. But yeah. So we're gonna get into this thing. Let's talk real quick just about his career, though. Um. I was kind of giving Sam the old rundown of like everything this guy has done. Um. I've compiled a list actually because I put together like the show notes or whatever ahead of time. I put together a list oh, damn. of um stuff that Jeremy's done. Um, so I just want to make mention of this. So kind of the most notable stuff is obviously Metal Gear, Sui Koden 2. Um, he did Silent Hill 2, 3, and 4. Um, mm-hmm. Castlevania Symphony of the Night, um, Shadow Hearts, Covenant, Dark Cloud 2, Snatcher, um, Dragon Warrior, Dragon Quest 7, the PS1 game, like the fucking hundred something hour title. Um, Whoa. Uh, he did the Pokemon anime since 2003. Uh, we get him to talk about why he isn't doing the Pokemon anime anymore in the interview, which is <laughs> a very funny story. And I had no idea about Spoiler, that. Spoiler, the reason heart, will so. probably not surprise you. Yeah. Um, he did Alundra 2 and Ape Escape 2. And fun fact, Jeremy's also done voices and been a voice director. Um, he directed the voice cast during Silent Hill 2 and essentially directed the voice cast for Metal Gear Solid 1. Um, huh. And boy, oh boy... Jeremy's got a tood, you guys. Jeremy is Sonic That's the Hedgehog. Of he men. is totally radical. Whoa. And yeah. he's Whoa. not and he's not he afraid about... to let everyone know it. How does he feel about chili dogs? Oh, I didn't fucking ask him. How did I not ask him? Damn it. Damn it. We, what if that needs to confirm it? I think I think he's more of a jelly filled donut kind of guy. Mm, you know, because you know, translations. Sense. What about like a maybe like a beignet? A beignet man? I can see him eating a beignet and enjoying I it. I don't even know or what like a beignet a... is. It's Whoa. like a... It's like a... What the fuck do you call those things that you get at fairs? The like cake? a funnel cake? Funnel cake. It's kind of like a funnel cake, but it's so like, like a, a donut. Like a funnel cake, but bad? Oh, like a funnel no. cake, but French. No. Like a funnel cake, so kind of like how a crepe, <laughs> is, uh, like, a, like, a crepe exact like a crepe is a pancake without the soul. Oh, no. A crepe is a pancake, but oh. better. Fight me. <laughs> I yeah. love I love if I love crepes. I'm just being contrarian. If it's French, it's probably better. Damn, Sam, I think we're we're digging a grave. Yeah, unless we're talking about weapon systems, oh, then yeah. No. Mm. Is, is that a fama? I like food. I love fama. Uh, <laughs> uh, MGS one throwback. We can't really like listen. The problem with um the problem with America. Oh no. Is that <laughs> we hate the, the problem friend. with America. We have to is pick that, like, up the slack for everybody else. Damn. No, I mean, we man, don't have like. Thank, thanks, Europe. It would be really nice, you know, if we could have a single payer healthcare program. You know, if we weren't having to subsidize mm-hmm. your national defense. Thanks, Europe. Nice. Yikes! <laughs> I like this. I'm liking this. Attitude. I'm liking this too. <laughs> James like Meadows, the Modus no, Atomori of uh, Metal Gear Mondays. <laughs> I, no, we don't I'm have. A, um, I'm a big fan really of Modus have... Atomori. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Mori's great. He has done some amazing work. You know, that's the that's the number one peop- question people ask me, like is when they find out that I'm into Metal Gear Solid and that I, I had some experience in the military. The first thing they ask is, is CQC a a real discipline? Is that something that's actually taught? And um, you would be surprised um, when you start getting into the higher levels of modern army combatives. Um, especially when they start introducing knives. Um, you know, obviously you're not, you know, holding a gun 
in your, you know, not dominant hand or you would just shoot them with it. But uh, Mm -hmm. a lot of the, uh, you know, like the hip tosses and the, uh, um, you know, limb limb and joint manipulation, that's all actually taught. What Um, about the, uh, what about the... Do you was the, do that, uh, that was ocelot <laughs> and uh, ocelot as we all know is russian and uh, yes. that would be a part of the russian uh hand-to-hand combat discipline <laughs> which is known as uh sistema and uh, i am unfor- uh, uh, I, I am unfortunately not familiar with sistema um so i was never taught the uh backflip hatchet move <laughs> um which if you actually go on youtube and search spetsnaz backflip hatchet like i'm not kidding this is a thing they do and it's a, it's a, it's incredible holy shit so yeah no they do crazy awesome. they do crazier stuff than rare nice for the so r- they don't so but do they so they don't give you like a they don't give everybody like a personal self-esteem team when they join <laughs> the military is that like well probably since since i've been out i'm sure that's a thing um, I, I heard they brought the stress cards back. Um, some of my, some of my stress z- cards. What's a stress card? Oh my god! god. Hold on, guys. I'm sorry. I got, I got to ground us real quick. We're going down a hole. We should cut to the interview and then come back after the interview. I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll do. We'll, <laughs> forgive we'll, me, we'll forgive me, back. Alessio. Son. We'll come back with. We'll come back with the answer. <laughs> What's a stress card? Yes. Find out next time on Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> what is a stress card? A miserable pile of secrets. <laughs> but enough talk. Listen to the podcast. One hundred percent. Right off the bat, I want to say I'm extremely, uh, genuinely thankful to uh, be talking to you right now, Jeremy. So welcome to the show. It's my pleasure. Now, do I? How do I tell me how to correctly mispronounce your name? Uh, do I say it's, Alessio? It's Alessio. I know. I wanted to correctly. <laughs> uh, I think the worst I've ever heard is Alertia or Alertia. something sort of bizarre. Yeah, I've gotten some you, very weird coffee you cups. With that? I have no clue. Um, from, from someone from the the south or something. <laughs> I'm just spending like uh, 13 years down south. It was down south, so ah. you your own. Look at that. Um, your your uh, expertise in languages comes through very strongly. It was not an accident. <laughs> um, I I'm not gonna lie. I uh, was reading through all the interviews that you've done in the past over the last couple of days, and uh, you have done quite a few exhaustive interviews on your background. Um, so I wanted I wanted to ask Jeremy if you were interviewing Jeremy Blaustein, what would be the question that you would ask Jeremy, knowing that he wanted to talk about it. I'd probably say, hey, Blaustein, what's your fucking problem? <laughs> uh, I like it. That's a good question. That's not going to be my first question. I think it's a good question. I'm Strong answer. I would, yeah, what I would, that's, that's probably how I would break the ice. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, well, yeah. Okay, so I, I noticed you have an attitude. What's your fucking problem? Yeah. What, what, is, what, what is your problem, Jeremy? I don't know. I think I, it's, just, it's just where I was born and raised. You know? But I'm, that, I'm that actually, being New Jersey? <clears throat> no, it was New York. It was Long Island, New York. But oh, okay. Right on. I've actually become a much... A much more uh, a kinder and gentler person, I, I think. In the last, the, the calmer Jeremy yeah, Blaustein. Yeah, I'm much. You know, it kind of tends to come out. My old ways tend to come out on these interviews. You know, I see. You're kind of the oh. bad boy of translation. <laughs> Does that fit your persona? <laughs> the bad boy of translation. Is there such a thing? A uh, I don't boy? know. I, I feel like I'm talking to the bad boy of translation. Bad boy of translation. Okay. The bad uh, boy of game translation. Okay, yeah, I I like that. I might have you, yeah. t-shirts made up. It's very so very nice. Um, I guess my my first real question is uh, considering uh your background and your history and the games that you've worked on. What is the most outrageous thing you've read about yourself on the internet? Hmm. I don't know if they're outrageous. I mean. People's reaction to me on the internet are pretty much the same reactions I get in real life. In my, um, for the most part, people really either like me or they <clears throat> dislike me in completely equal measure. Oh no! Yeah, it's 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 usually pretty split. Like I really like your honesty, or he's just a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Is it like that in the industry as well, or is that just like uh, with onlookers? I don't know. You know, it, you say the industry, but it's funny because, you know, indiv- freelance translators, we really don't 
we really don't meet anybody. We we basically live these, you know, solitary lives, sitting in our homes, translating in front of our computer, <laughs> you know. So, <clears throat> except That's when I was in Konami, I, I don't I don't really I don't really deal with other people that much, you know. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I noticed that like in your in the other interviews of yours that I had read, it seems like m- most of sort of what you're, I would say, I guess, like well known for, in a good or a bad way, uh, seems to come from the time that you spent at Konami. Uh, but coincidentally, it seems like you describe those years as being the toughest, like professional years that you've worked. Do you think those two things are related? Yeah, except you know those years weren't. I wasn't. I wasn't really a translator then. Oh, I see. So, <clears throat> it, you know. I was a I was a businessman, hmm. but you know I was just at a I was just at a company. I was just went to Tokyo for a, to to meet a company there, um, DMM. If anybody wants to look it up, and they'll probably get a pretty good idea of what I've been doing for the last couple of years. If you look up DMM, okay. But um, yeah, let me take a look at this. Very cool office, very cool office. Oh my god! I think if you Google DMM office, you'll see what. <laughs> the office I went to. Uh, cool. Yeah, let me look it up. But yeah, so no, I only bring that up to say that um, oh, no, wow. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not a dick when I deal with people in the industry. In fact, I brought these guys a couple bottles of uh, Japanese sake. Oh, very nice. Um, what what kind of sake do you buy f- Japanese people that work in this extravagant of an office? Well, I bought them. I was in. It was a Roppongi, so I went to a supermarket. I desperately needed something. You know, I couldn't go them go to them with my hands empty, and I was going to stop off somewhere and get them some like really good chocolate or something. But I wound up getting there like late, and I had to dash around. So I got gotcha. to the supermarket. And I'm like, you know, you can't you can't just bring somebody a bag full of nuts. Like, <laughs> well, it's got to be packaged. So the only thing they had at the supermarket that was like packaged enough to to, to give as a present was 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 booze. So I'm thinking, do I go, you know, do I go whiskey? Do I go, you know, wine? And I just wound up getting the sake, which was actually is good because it's 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 uh, it's um, cherry blossom season now. So I told the guys who aren't Japanese sake drinkers, I said, you can like be the life of the party. Just when you go to the, your your cherry blossom viewing, bring along the bottle of sake. People will think you're like a super sophisticated dude. That's awesome. Well, that's a traditional thing to do. Sake underneath the, the cherry blossoms. That sounds very nice. Yeah. I'm in uh, extremely like cold St. Louis right now, so that sounds it's still cold. fantastic. It, it just recently started warming up. Yeah. You can probably hear it in my voice. My sinuses are going crazy, but yeah. woof, it is what it is. Um, you've bounced so, yeah. around a lot between – oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just I was thinking that's not a very satisfi- satisfying answer about the craziest thing people said about me. <laughs> oh, okay, here's, here's a here's a crazy thing. Uh just random. Um people that <laughs> people make up the stupidest shit too. Like oh, they absolutely he's talking about Silent Hill too. How about this? That Silent Hill is all about male circumcision. <laughs> that's, the secret, that's the secret subtext. I love it. Yeah. Is that what you had in mind whenever you were, exactly. whenever you were putting was, that together? I was, hinting, I was hinting about circumcision in pretty much every line I wrote. Uh, a little bird tells me that the number one thing that you wish you could talk more about in these interviews is uh, the dissonance between gameplay and uh, narrative in video games. Is that true? Can you elaborate? Yeah, so sort of like the ludo narrative dissonance between like gameplay as a vehicle for narrative versus like narrative as a vehicle for good gameplay. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I hear that that's uh, that that's what excites Jeremy Blaustein. Hmm. Actually, I hadn't really thought about it for a while, but um, yeah, I mean, the only time I can remember that really coming up as a subject is when there's you know when there's a tremendous mismatch. I tend to think they. You know they they should flow together and they usually do, mm-hmm. um, but there are certain notable exceptions, like David Cage's games. <laughs> I'm I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, have you? Uh, what games do you play for pleasure, Jeremy? Do you play anything for like I know? So besides Fallout Two and Fable, 
Yeah. Do you, do you play games for pleasure at all? I don't like I haven't played I've been so busy the last um I don't know, like the last two years, honestly. Um the only games I've played in the last couple of years have been like UFC and like uh you know, because I like to watch MMA. Yeah. UFC and uh shit, I don't know. I mean like I sometimes bust out civilization or um nice. I like uh um what's those those uh those those war games, uh, Caesar and uh, um, Rome. Mm. Uh, ult- Total War. Total War, yeah. I like the Total War games, you know. So nice. I sort of bust those out, but I don't really have any time to play games. Right on. Have you been, like, the last yeah. two years, you've been, you've been busy with the Dragon Baby stuff? Is that what's kept you? Kept no. No, I mean, Dragon Baby is just, is just a, a name that I launched to try to see if I could... You know, I don't want to launch another company, you know, because company, you got to deal with like all sorts of stupid adult stuff like taxes and stuff like that. So I just thought I would just launch a name, you know, a company uh, doing business as name and I just call it Dragon Baby. But nice. It's just basically me and whoever I can bring in when the need arises. Gotcha. Yeah, because I noticed that, uh, and I'm probably going to butcher the hell out of these names, but like, uh, I noticed like the Zpang and the whatever the I Q I O E. How would you pronounce it? Ikioi, yeah. Ikioi. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I noticed that you seemed like post Konami. Jeremy seems to have been a rambling man. So yeah, I, was, I was curious about the wanderlust. <laughs> I've had, I've, 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 you know, I've started and been part of you know different companies launching and stuff like that. And yeah, I mean, in a, within 25 year span, most of them don't work out. You know, is it difficult to start a company in Japan versus like, I think in the States there's like a yeah. small business, like you yeah. trip down the road and there's a small business, you know? Yeah, I, mean? I think in Japan you, it may have changed now, but I think at least you used to need a Japanese partner and you know, you have to put in a lot of um, capital or at least you used to and taxes get kind of nasty and, and yeah, but, and, and there's, you know, there's some, there's some, Clients that won't deal with you unless you're a company, you know? Yeah, I definitely understand. As I get older and closer to the quote-unquote finish line, I just, you know, like I just want to pay my bills and get my kids through college and shit like that, so. Well, what's the finish line for, <laughs> for you? <my> death. <laughs> oh, no. Well, you, I think you're good for a while there, I hope. <laughs> well, I'll be 53 in a couple months. I still look good, but... <laughs> <laughs> Three it's all the stock a i bet old as shit yeah. uh what's uh so you've bounced around a lot between america and japan i've noticed because it seemed like you moved back to the states for a time because of your daughter I was back in the states for 15 years yeah and then you moved again yeah we moved uh, back here about 10 years ago what uh do you do you prefer to live in one country over the other i prefer japan oh really yeah what uh what is it about japan that you prefer um Sounded leading. I apologize. I didn't yeah, mean for that to no, be like a leading question. I'm legitimately curious. Oh no, no. If you're, if I mean, you're legitimately curious. Um, from my perspective, it's, um, like there's so many ways to approach that, that question. But I guess I could say it like this: um, that I think that a culture, a country, has to have um, certain minimum requirements met for the majority of people in order to create a kind of a base, a, uh, a groundwork so that people can live there in a healthy, you know, uh, uh, an emotionally healthy way and, and, and treat each other with some degree of, you know, kindness and dignity. They, they, they need, they need to have their certain minimum requirements met, you know, like health and, dental health and uh, insurance and, you know, not being one paycheck away from homelessness and for sure and um, threats of violence and, you know, those kinds of things and, and decent service. And, you know, and, and when you live in a country that has those things, all sorts of, um, it's, it, it, it's like the age old question, can love bloom on a battlefield? <laughs> yeah. And the answer is uh, no. I don't think so. <laughs> that was very good. I, I really appreciated that, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, yeah. So it sounds like all the things that keep me awake at night here in the U.S. is why you prefer Japan. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the sales calls. Oh, of course. I bet. And the spending a day on the 
spending a day on the phone, like trying to like deal with like a mistake with your credit card, you know? Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Drug me up the wall. Is it not like that in Japan at all? Yeah, it's not like that in Japan at all. Oh, okay. That's wild. I had no idea that yeah, things like, like that weren't, I guess. Yeah, like, yeah that's crazy. Yeah, because it's amazing what happens when you pay people livable wages. Oh, and, yeah, I yeah. bet. Customer service probably shoots through the roof. Yeah, it shoots through the roof. Jesus. Well, I definitely did not know about that. I think uh, being a young man who grew up on uh, anime JRPGs and Pocky, uh, there is a little bit of like a fetishization, I guess, of yeah. Eastern culture that happens, which sucks and I'm not super proud of. But I, I hope to one day uh, travel out to Japan uh, at some point. And uh, I don't know. It was cool to see you really enjoying it out there because I think... I'm, based on, I'm, on, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm always, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful on a nearly daily basis that I'm here. Honestly, now I'm going to get hate mail. Oh most, no! Most fucking hates, fucking hates America. No, our listeners are not shitheads. Okay. I hope. I hope not. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah. I, what? So did you? Were you fascinated with Japan as a uh, youth? Is that why you studied no, Japanese I, language in not college? Really, no, it wasn't really that. It was more like I, I felt like the most. I, you know, I got I graduated from high school and I got into college, and you know, all of a sudden you've got this like course catalog, mm-hmm. and you know, um, if you can cast your memory back to high school when you felt like a an un an unformed ball of clay sort of mm-hmm. with no details you know and you get into college and you've got this big course catalog and like the world begins to open up and you know you have this option to learn options to learn all these different things you know to become something interesting and um i didn't feel like anything interesting but i wanted to be an interesting person so the drugs can only take you so far <laughs> you know, right and so um I was into stuff like Lord of the Rings and like that kind of stuff. And uh, so my first choice was I took a course called um, Medieval Welsh Literature. Holy shit. Celtic, Celtic and Welsh Literature. Cause, cause I could, you know? So, like, yeah, right on. like oh man, Gawain and the Green Knight, you know, like, cool. <laughs> you know, I'll learn the sources. And so I wanted to study Welsh just cause I figured if I could learn the weirdest language possible, then I would become a really interesting person. Just, you know, like by proxy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, well, you know, so um, I was going to take Welsh, but the Welsh teacher said, uh, basically she, you know, she knocked me on the head and said like, well, like, don't, don't study Welsh. What are you going to, what are you going to do with Welsh? You know, <laughs> she did the opposite of her job though. She did. <laughs> that's right. She did the opposite of her job. Um, and so I, I looked back in that course catalog and then I, uh, I was thinking Russian, Chinese, Japanese. And then I started to remember, you know, we all have associations, primitive associations with countries. Mm-hmm. When we don't know anything, we we get a few facts and then we kind of in our, our imaginations build, you know, fill in the, the blanks, I guess. And something I must have I must have had a, a, a pretty good read on Japan in some sense because when I look back on it now I think that so my my influences back then were like I'd seen the Seven Samurai, mm-hmm. okay, uh, the seventies uh, TV series Shogun, if you know that with Richard mm-hmm. Chamberlain, mm-hmm. you know, Hi Anjin San Wakari Mashta, that one, um, and uh, sushi, which boomed in like the early eighties. I got on that train. So uh, for me, the associations of Japan was um, one of or order and a kind of sense that they, you know, they there was rules that one had to follow, and I don't know why that appealed to me. Probably it was just because, you know, I grew up in such kind of chaos, lack of rules, and um, I think I wanted some, you know, cleanliness and cleanness and 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 I a sense of what is the correct thing to do in this the chaos of not knowing what to do. I wanted some kind of order. And what, that was a pretty good read. What was your childhood like? Did you, did you grow up like privileged or? Yeah, no, I mean, 
I think, yeah, my parents had money, but like a lot of parents had money back then. You think about it. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's amazing how much money people in that generation had. I, right. I is that pre, all. is that pre like the big wall street crash of like the late eighties? Oh yeah. Shit. Yeah. I mean, I was born in 66. So yeah. 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 Right on. I'm, you know, I'm talking about, you know, mid seventies, mm. you know, people had money then. My dad, you know, he would like buy like boats and motor homes and trailers and shit like that. He was, you know, but my dad, he was, a, he was a dentist and then he, you know, got a PhD. So he was like a brilliant guy. And my mom That's was awesome here, but we had five kids and, um, it was just chaos. You know, we would, we had dogs and we had fleas in the house and we would throw food at the walls and <laughs> it's going crazy and just, you know, stepping in dog shit. And it's like, cause my mom didn't know how to do the, she didn't know how to clean up. Oh no. So yeah. So I, you know, I guess I wanted just some degree of like chill. <laughs> Jeremy's quest for tranquility. Quest for chill. Yeah. I like it. How, uh, how difficult is it having kids and working in a creative field? Do I work in a creative field? I mean, I, I would assume so. I don't know. No, uh, do you not think I, you do? I think I do not. I mean, especially <laughs> now. No, especially now. I mean, I'm sorry to 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 drop these uh, this the, the drop the darkness. But, oh no, please um, do. Yeah, no, because localization now. If if it ever was, um, one in one which could be defined as creative, it certainly is not now. It certainly is not now. What's the difference? Oh, uh, the difference is, um, or I mean, I'm speaking from extreme ignorance. So I, I just, yeah, okay, I'm, no, um, yeah, what's the difference now and then? Let me, let me, let me give you three differences. Okay. You know, maybe there's two, maybe there's four. I don't know, but I'll give you three. Okay. Um, one, technology. Two, um, the amount of money being made in the industry. And so therefore the amount of attention being given to what we do. Mm -hmm. That's two, right? Do I, I need one more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Uh, the amount of people doing translation, doing game translation would be, would be another difference. So uh, the technology, what do I mean? So now people use, uh, you know, cat tools, right? Com uh, computer assisted translation tools, which is not to say that we're using. Um... Come here, Katie. I was going to say, I, I hear that wonderful cat in the background. Yeah, she's so cute. What's um, her name? Her name's Ruby. Oh, hi, Ruby. Yeah, she appears in the game. Um, uh, um, what was that game? The uh, the uh, Kamae Tachi no Yoru. We called that uh, uh, Cry of the Banshee. Oh, nice. Yeah, I think I was reading about that uh, a couple yeah. nights ago, actually. Yeah. Um, hey, this is Alessio jumping in really quickly with a quick correction. Um, the name of the game is actually Banshee's Last Cry, not Cry of the Banshee. So yeah, computer assisted translation. So we use these these tools that uh, <laughs> be quite <cheesy laughs> um, So we're doing the translations, and they're they're appearing, you know, uh, online in these tools that the other translators can see. And mm -hmm. let's let's say generally there's you know three or four people on a project. So the the translation as it goes on, the glossary is collected, and. Uh, since it's being monitored and viewed by other translators and the editors and all these things, uh, and multiple people are doing it, you tend to to do the safest translation, mm. and 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 you're getting paid less now too. By the way, then you know I I used to get paid more than I twenty years ago. I paid I got paid more than I do now. Even at Konami, you know, fuck Konami. I'm I'm talking about <laughs> you know, like translator. I wasn't a translator of Konami. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, as a freelance translator per word or per emoji, uh, we used to get paid more. Okay. Um, and so now, you know, cost of living, we just have to get more efficient, work quicker. So all those things being as they are, um, and with CAD tools, companies don't pay you for repeat translations and these kinds of things. You tend, you know, you're just translating and you're being very conservative. When you translate, you can be, you can either be conservative and like just do what's there. Or you can be creative and mm -hmm. sort of pump, pump it up, you know, like, because when you translate, color gets drained out of the original text, generally. When you when you just translate something from when you when you're translating the meaning of something 
all that you're left with is the meaning and the <clears throat> the color around it is lost. So you need to re-add color. And that's the that's the creative part. That's a really good analogy. I guess I never thought of it like that. It's like yeah, yeah, when yeah, you almost have to. Uh, it's almost like you're. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like you're freeze drying it, and then you almost have to like add water to it again. Yeah, to kind yeah, of it come yeah. You're, it's like you're you 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 strip it of everything except for the the meaning, and mm -hmm. then you 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 put it into the biggest mistake translators make is they they become slaves to the original text. Right, right. And so you see the words bit by bit, and you translate that. But what you really need to do is kind of like, you know, absorb the meaning of it and then reimagine it and recontextualize it and then put it into a, um, a creative or, a, or, or, a, you know, a more natural sounding thing so that it has some, some flavor to it. Otherwise yeah. And so, but when you have four people translating it and they're translating as quickly as they can go and the glossary is sort of automatically plugged in and you, you, you just, you're, and, and also we're not seeing the games. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if people don't know this, but we, we're not playing these games and I don't, you know, I'm sure there's some translators out there that are going to say, Oh, Blaustein doesn't know what he's talking about. And, you know, there's certainly going to be cases where a company I guess does show you the game, but I've got a lot of experience, man. And I don't, you know, I'm not, I would say like, it's pretty rare. You know, once in a while, before you start a project, they'll say, okay, we want you to familiarize yourself with the game. Can you download it and play it? Or can you, you know, maybe you'll check out some YouTube videos. Gotcha. But for the most part, they're working you as fast as they can because they're being pressured to get this thing done as quickly as possible. Nobody's saying, you know, nobody says, here, here's a list of things people don't say. <clears throat> Take your time. We just want the best quality possible. And however, you know, just get it back to us when you when you feel it's it's nice and polished and you're ready. Okay, there's no rush at all. That, you know, that's like, <laughs> that's, uh, that's crazy. Well, and so so you just I'm assuming get like text dumps. Then is that all you get now? Yeah. Well, they're on these. They're on these. Uh, they're usually on these these computers, just the translation thing. So gotcha, you'll get, gotcha, gotcha. yeah, yeah. So yeah, basically. Was that always been that way, or was it different back no, in the day? No, and actually, you know, and I should add, in, in a way, it's even worse because uh, what these one of the things these 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 tools do is, uh, let's say you have a paragraph. You know, it it consists of eight sentences or something. Mm -hmm. Well, these tools they'll strip sentence by sentence and put them in there. So your first string is this sentence. Your second string is this sentence. So whatever slim context you had can also be lost because the tool wants to break it into sentences so that it can um, store it in its little memory. Gotcha. And, right. And so, yeah. Uh, was it always this way? No, we used to get even worse, uglier text. <laughs> you know, like I. You didn't get ROM coding. files or anything back in the day? <laughs> Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, people ask why Dra Dragon Quest Seven was such a mess, or Sui Code and Two, why there's so many translation mistakes, um, because we would just get these dumps. In the case of Dragon Quest, uh, was it Dragon Quest or was it Sui Code? I can't. They were both such a mess. I, I'm having trouble. They're both them. a lot of fucking game, like especially yeah, Dragon you know, Quest. Like that's a lot of game to be well, translated. Did, yeah, and they would when you got the text dumps, you would get just the, the lines, for example, and the, the characters, it was probably compiled in the program. You know, probably there was something in the code that said, okay, this is character 007 speaking. So the code would put, you know, jewelry or whatever in front of the name, mm -hmm. but we would get these text dumps and we would only have lines. Oh like, no. So you go down too. We didn't know who was speaking, whether it was a woman or a man or what the character's name was. And, you know, you might say, well, why didn't you just tell them you couldn't do it or, you know, but the thing was, it, it wasn't really an environment where you could do that back then um, for various reasons.
Yeah, that makes which sense. Which I don't know if anyone's interested in, but... Well, and I feel like given the fact that... Uh, and I don't know if... Uh, I feel like this got covered in some of the other interviews, but like you getting fired for insubordination in, right. I mean, in that, the 90s. That, I don't know if uh, if that yeah. put you on a... If, was that on like a record? Like, could anybody see that? Did anybody know about that? Are we talking about my first job? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, I wasn't even there long enough to... Oh, okay, right on. Anybody to... No. Okay, cool. So you got um, a free pass. What? A free pass? Yeah, you got a free pass to to, to get get kicked off the first one and that was okay. Oh, 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 you mean like did other people um oh yeah, no, no, yeah, I got a I got a free pass. Nobody was yeah. Nice. Um Yeah, I mean um but that sort of situation was kind of you know, I mean I didn't play it all that well politically with like Metal Gear Solid, for example. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. That's the other thing about trying to do a good job is there's always this there's always this um, con- conflict between making waves and doing a good job. You know, probably in every every job, not just translation. If you want to do a good job, you got to kind of be a pain in the ass. And you ruffle feathers. You make other people look bad, or you know. So yeah, it's interesting because I feel like, especially in like sort of uh, startup America, I feel like being an asshole is actually like kind of smiled upon a little bit. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. assuming it's not that way where, where you are. I think that there's some truth to what you're talking about. You know, Americans do tend to recognize that there, that this conflict exists, you know, um, you know, it's sort of like I was reading, I was at this friend's house and he had this book talking that was written about this, uh, um, the difference between American baseball and Japanese baseball, which is, you know, kind of, going off subject, but sort of on the subject because yeah. it's a good analogy for um, the different ways that, you know, the culture applies to an individual versus group. You know, I like it. So in this, I bring it up because, you know, like uh, in America, a, a great baseball player, you know, a superstar, he can go into the dugout and he can take his bat and just beat the shit out of stuff. And, you know, because he's a superstar. Right. And it's sort of like, as an American, you're like, you accept it because you know that the qualities that make him like that are, are the same qualities that make him a great player. Mm. Right? Yeah, I never considered that, but yeah, I think you're totally right. He's like solely he's totally focused. He only cares about the game and, you know, he doesn't think about social niceties. And we don't want a guy who thinks about social niceties. We want a guy who's the greatest at the game. Right. And if he's an asshole, it's fine because, you know, he's the best. Yeah, it's a and, sacrifice he has to make, I guess. Right? Which is another way of saying that if you if you're the best at something, we make allowances for bad behavior. I think that's fa- I think that's a fair read. I think it's a super fair read, especially considering all the uh, crazy shit that's going on in the uh, headlines in the last ten right. years. So we not only do we make, and and then when you reverse that again, what you wind up is with almost a, a phenomenon where the more of an asshole that a person appears to be, the more that they can sort of create an image that they are great at something. I mean, we're not all that, not everyone is a good judge of who is good at something. And yet we, we pretend like we say, Oh, you know, that's really good pizza or that's a really good baseball player or whatever. Mm -hmm. But how many of us are really good judges? So what do we rely upon to, as our indicator for whether or not that person is great at it? Well, I think in large, largely people can take advantage of that phenomenon by being an asshole or a prima donna, you can convince a certain number of people that you're great, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've got this, you know. It's like reverse psychology. That's crazy. When then you have all these, you have this this trove of people emulating what they see in those people. Right, 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 right. There's that sort of trickle down. Right. right. And so so in in Japan now, I don't know, how did we even get into this? Um, (laughs) But uh, in Japan... I don't. I don't actually remember what. I lost the thread. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what we were talking about now. But in uh, Japan, it's it's not the case anyway that you know uh, people can't just go go off and. and <laughs> I'm telling my kid yet. Oh no, you're totally fine. Go 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 go. go. 
I, I, I recall what we were talking about now. I think we were, oh, talking, we, we were talking about you getting off on bad behavior at your first job. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. has your... Has your so it's interesting because like the Jeremy Blaustein that I know is uh, at J Blau on Twitter and uh, the Jeremy that appears in various interviews. Um, and you seem like a very like, I don't know, just like off the cuff, genuine, straight talk kind of guy. Um, do you have to change your approach when you're dealing with the more professional Japanese formal setting? Like, how does that, how does that translate? Well, it's a good question. I, I think that, you know, when you learn Japanese, it sort of changes you just as a language, just linguistically, when you speak it, um, you almost can't, you just can't be the way I am in English, <laughs> for one thing. And then um, socially, well, you know, it's like I was saying, I mean, there's a certain amount of I mean, I, prob probably I could be accused of doing what I just said before that, you know, on some level, you know, acting like a prima donna <laughs> asshole, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe what I'm doing is subconsciously spreading this, you know, image that I, that I'm, that I know what I'm doing or that I'm, you know, creative or that I'm interesting or something like this. But, you know, in, in, in Japan, it, it's no, it's no, um, it's no virtue to be an asshole. Mm. <laughs> you know, uh, and yet creatively, you know, you do need to stand up for yourself when you want to make, it happens all the time, not just creatively, but anything in Japan, it's, it's a weakness of Japan. It's not a great thing. That, um, it's not a great thing that people don't stand up and, um, for what's right or for what's you know, creatively right or. Yeah, is it People difficult? Tend, is it difficult to it die on a hill in it Japanese? It, it's it's difficult. It, it's really difficult. People don't want to stand out and um, make waves or be responsible, be the single person responsible for making a decision. So they 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 collectively spread responsibility when decisions are made. You know. Mm -hmm. That's um, interesting. That's interesting to say that because I think it tracks with a lot of the uh, sort of like internal development research that we've done specifically for this show kind of talking about past projects and stuff so i think i think that yeah. tracks that's i mean it's also one of the saddest things i think i've ever heard is just like uh i guess a whole culture of just like really meek people trying not to piss anybody off are there jerks in japanese the video game industry the people aren't meek you know don't, yeah, don't yeah, yeah. Me. the people aren't meek it's just that um the the places where people's lives rub together, which gotcha. is to say the commons, the, so, the, the, you know, f the commons, as you would say, like the, f the physical, the physical representation of that would be where, you know, you go out and you're in public. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Those are where we, where we, you know, interact with each other. When you're in those places, you be, you have a social self that is less um, aggressively individualistic. Because so all the, the, the sharp parts that stick out get, you know, you kind of rub them down. So we interact smoothly with each other. But it doesn't mean that you don't have those sharp parts in, in, your, in, your, in your private life, you know. It's gotcha. just that when other people are involved, you, you retract those things. So meekness is not, you know, I'm in a karate dojo. I've been doing karate really intensely. And it's not, believe me. They're not meek. Yeah, that's fair. That's <laughs> fair. It sounds like the, uh, so I grew up uh, in an Italian American household, but specifically ah. I've, I've got Sicilian, like my mom's whole side of the family is still in Sicily. So I have to like go back. I and in Italian, and yeah, my, my neighborhood was all Italian. In New York. Yeah. So I was going to say, that sounds like the very opposite of Italian culture where yeah. it's loud yeah. and very sharp in public. Italians are Italians to me being from New York, you know, I, and then I moved to the Midwest. Italians and Jews are like the same. Totally. You know, well, and me being from a Jewish uh, and Italian yeah. family. It's, like exactly, it's exactly the same. I can't tell the difference between New York Italians and New York Jews, really. Like, yeah, that's crazy. All right, so, so I guess in general, a question that I had, and I wasn't quite sure where to put this, but I think this makes the most sense. A question that I had for you is like, 
coming from New York in the Midwest and ending up in Japan, what's maybe like a preconceived notion that you took with you either into Japan or like the video games industry in Japan that you just realized didn't hold any actual water when you got there? Like, did you bring anything with you that you were like, oh, this is going to be how it is. And then you showed up for your first day and you were like, wait, what? Um, mm, no, I don't, I don't really, I'm not, I don't, I don't have anything. Nothing really comes to mind. I, I think okay. that mostly I, I, I had strong expectations that everything would be so different that for me, the process of cultural shock is never been one of discovering that the other is strange, but rather discovering the strangeness of your own culture, mm. which you only see when you get outside of it. Right. So that's, that's cultural shock for me. Right. Looking, looking at myself. Yeah. And I can only imagine, cause even like whenever I go to Europe to visit, uh, even the like Western view on America is very different being in Europe. Right. So I can't imagine right. going to like a completely different culture and, and seeing completely that. Different. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Um, Japan's really, really different. Yeah. Really, really different. Yeah. I can imagine there's a uh, there's a fellow there's a British guy who I think moved to Japan to teach ESL who's been charting mm. like every day of his life on YouTube mm. and it, it's been like super interesting I'm trying to remember what it's called I think it's called like uh, an Englishman abroad or like abroad in Japan oh, or something that familiar, yeah. um, and those videos have been really cool to watch just because mm. uh, somebody who's into aspects of the culture but hasn't been over there it's really cool to kind of see it through the lens of of another right western right. guy yeah but um nice did you you mentioned uh you mentioned lord of the rings and fantasy and stuff when you were in college had you seen blade runner prior to working on snatcher yeah nice so you knew that this was it was just a big fucking rip off essentially yeah <laughs> I did. I did. How, how did that how did that blow but, over did I mean, you just kind of take well, it I mean, I, I'd, I'd also seen <clears throat> i'd also seen um dune oh fair enough yeah the, yeah, wait, so the David I, Lynch Dune? Dune? Yeah. Oh, no. <clears throat> so I knew the whole ball of wax. I mean, Terminator, Blade Runner, Dune, I, I knew where everything that Kojima stole from was. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's crazy. Did you did you have a good time? It didn't matter. It? Huh? Did you enjoy it? Like, personally? Was it, like, a fulfilling thing? Or was it, like, a, uh -huh. a, just a Yeah, thing? I enjoyed it a lot. I enjoyed it a lot. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I think one yeah, of the things because I got out, I'm sorry, go ahead. I got out of my office. I was called into I was I was I worked for well, I want to say a couple months in R and D, which was what I always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Normally, I was working in this like stuffy office environment where people did you know really button down business stuff, and this allowed me to be in the R and D building working with the guys who made games. So yeah, it was great. That's awesome. Speaking of working on games, there was something of yours that I was interested to talk about because I saw it and had never known about it, I guess, at the time. Um, originally, I was going to ask you, translating other people's work all the time, uh, mm -hmm. have you ever felt the urge to like write like your original stuff? But then I stumbled across Blackmore. What mm -hmm. happened to that guy? Well... Um... I mean, on one level, I could just say it just didn't—it just didn't make enough money to progress. So, gotcha. You know, I mean, um, yeah, I've always wanted to make a game, but making games is is a tough business, especially especially now with the. Well, it's weird now. I mean, you could say because the 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 software and the middleware or whatever the hardware. For making games, it's so advanced now. You can get this like off the shelf stuff, Unity, and all this stuff, and buy pre made, you know, three D things, and mm -hmm. sort of slam together a game. On you know, on one level, you can do that, or you can you know use these things like RPG Maker and these kinds of things. So games, it's it's not games are not harder to make; they're probably easier to make. Um, but um, yeah. So I don't know what I was going to say. We didn't, we didn't make enough money, so it wasn't going to happen. But yeah, I think it, 
it, it, it, it would have been an interesting story. I did spend a lot of time thinking about the story. Yeah, because I was curious whenever I saw I saw the Kickstarter, and I also said that I guess like Polygon and a couple other sites covered it. Yeah, well, was, you know, we got into that. The thing is, we got into that really without any. We we rushed the Kickstarter because, um, I was kind of afraid that Kickstarter was on the way out because there'd been some some big Kickstarter projects around that time that had made a lot of money, and then you know it's like some of them ended in kind of broken promises. And I don't know, I was feeling like how much longer can this Kickstarter thing work? So we rushed ahead with it without a firm idea of, you know, how we were going to make the game or how, what, whether it was going to be Polygon or this or that. And, and then the next thing we know, people were like, we want to see some, you know, screenshots, but we were you know, it wasn't in development. It was, mm-hmm. we wanted, it's like kick, start it's not <laughs> kick it's not like fucking yeah, kick, start kick and finish line. yeah and it's not like kick middle it's mm-hmm. fucking kick start so <clears throat> we didn't have anything to show but you know then there's all these people like that are like you know i don't know smells fishy or you know yeah there's a lot of weird I mean, I would, I would, internet i went into it with an honest you know idea that it, you know if we got the money we would make a game but after some exposure to that Kickstarter culture and seeing other things that happened, and I was kind of glad it didn't work because mm-hmm. I don't really need fucking people like looking over my shoulder for like two years. Yeah, totally. I, I definitely understand that. I think yeah. it's difficult. So, like, I, uh, I guess I have a little bit of experience. I've had some failed Kickstarters as well, but like as a f- independent filmmaker, it's uh, yeah recently I kind of lucked out and have happened to find like an independent contributor who's kind of given me a bunch Mm. of money for like a pet project short film. That's Um, great. But it's like, even that is such a weird feeling knowing Mm. that like there's a guy I have to report to like every week. You know what I mean? Yeah. I totally know what you mean. So is that, I've been been a freelancer for 25 years, man. Yeah. So yeah, like being, I guess, because for all intents and purposes, like you're your own boss, right? You're just a solo, solo freelancer with. Yeah. Okay. Is it difficult to stay? Like, I guess for me, the thing, because I've done some freelance film work for several years as well, but like, is it difficult when you're at home doing the work to keep from getting distracted? Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah. I just, you know, now it's just a part of my. I mean, I'm really disciplined now in a way. Um, I'm much, much more disciplined working than I used to be because hmm. for one thing that, you know, weed, weed is illegal here in Japan. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> when I was in the States, I was just like, you know, basically constantly high. Fair enough. Um, but here in Japan, I'm not. Instead, I do <laughs> cut, you know, you're just grumpy and translating. I'm grumpy. I translate and then I, I do karate. Nice. I like that. That's a good, so, uh, is that a typical Wednesday for you? No, I, I train a few times a week. Nice. Yeah, it's and interesting uh, to have this conversation when we're on like a 14-hour time difference. I'm not used to talking to somebody from the future. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, um, What's Wednesday like? It's like every other day. I work, I work, you know, I work six or seven days a week these last couple couple years. Just I just try to make as much money as I can. <laughs> you know, I just work constantly. And, you know... And and when I work, you know, sometimes I'm doing stuff that's so easy to translate that I put on, you know, I got, you know, one window is my 600 pound life streaming. <laughs> you know, I'm translating. I love it. You know, I'm, I'm a weirdo. I, 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 sometimes I need to keep one half of my brain. I like reality TV shows because they're sufficiently stupid that they don't require much attention. Right. I can't really watch a movie, like a good movie or anything like that while I'm working because it requires attention, but if you got, you know, just like yeah, reality rules TV show. Like, yeah, what, yeah. What, what shows are you watching over there? Are you, uh, are you getting watch, those yeah. shows or are they in Japanese? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I just stream. Like I just, I just go to one of these, like, you know, watch TV online things. Yeah. Watch TV watch online. Dot net or what have you. Yeah. So like I'm digging like, you know, American gods right now. Oh, nice. Very nice. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I was going through some of the information and I don't know if this is factual or not. You've, have you translated Pokemon since 2003, the television show? 
Yeah, I stopped working on it a couple of years ago, though. They fired me. Oh, no, they fired you? They let me go. Oh, they just they didn't renew me. the contract? It wasn't a contract. It was, you know, the oh, work nice. was just flowing. And a typical insubord- insubordinate blast team. <laughs> they, so they need you to put your gun and badge on the table by the end of the day, essentially? Yeah, it was it was so stupid because I was I was trying to help them, you know, with a difficult aspect of the translation, mm-hmm. you know, and you mean when Ash became a man, it was difficult to get that translate. I'm sorry, it's bad joke. <laughs> uh, no, so, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> Professor Oaks got a brother, mm-hmm. right, and this brother is the head of this like school, and. The uh, his brother, this Professor Oak's brother, has got this weird thing where he um, he makes these puns based on the Pokemon. Oh, that sounds amazing! Pokemon, right. So let's say um, he'll say like you know, let's say he's, he's going to say how are you, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of saying how are you, he'll say like how. How are you? And then he'll he'll pick a Pokemon whose name is like, you know, starts with the sound you. Mm-hmm. Like he might say like, how are you, Unisaurus? You know? <laughs> yeah. Right? And then when he says it, his face turns into a Unisaurus or whatever. Right? <laughs> this sounds great. You've got me so yeah, far. Okay. okay. But the thing is this. The Japanese names for the Pokemon are completely different, right? Oh, correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we're speaking in a different language. So instead of saying, how are you, Unisaurus? He might be saying, uh, Konichi Wagamon. Mm, okay. Right? Now, Wagamon may be translated as, you know, butterfree, butterfree yeah. or whatever. I'm just, I'm just throwing right shit on. out there. Right on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right? <clears throat> and Konichi Wa means, you know, hello or good day, right? Mm-hmm. Butterfree, I'm just, you know, butterfree starts with a ba. Mm-hmm. So how do I say how are you with i need the bus sound Mm -hmm. and i can't change the pokemon because his face is turning into the fucking pokemon Mm, okay that makes sense it's a it's a it's a trend it's a localization riddle that almost can't be solved right and that's crazy and so they fought you on that like that's what you were starting we were starting the new season right right this character uh comes out you know comes out of nowhere and i saw in the first episode you know that this was going to be a thing. So I, I wrote them an email and I said, okay, here's the situation. There's, this is very difficult to translate because, um, you know, this guy does this in Japanese and the, the Pokemon names is this. And, and, uh, so I think we need to, um, talk about this for the upcoming season and see if we can't come up with a creative solution for how to deal with this. Mm-hmm. And I sent it to them. And the response I got was something like, uh, well, essentially, just shut up and translate it. Oh no! Are you kidding me? That's crazy. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not kidding it. You know, and it, you know, it's like sometimes you know, there's people that just don't want to hear hear shit. You know, they they don't want to hear there's a problem. You know, oh, there's gas leaking and uh, above an open flame. Oh, no. uh, for, oh, shut the fuck up and you know, yeah, cook the hamburger. Burger, you know? It's fine. Yeah, I like how we both yeah. the hamburgers. Yeah. <laughs> It's like that, you know. That's wild. But, well, but, 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 but why didn't you tell me there was going to be an explosion? But 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 I did it, you know. Right. So that's like that. That's bananas. Man. Have you? Yeah. Have you done? So I saw also there was like some Ninja Warrior and like muscle rankings on your yeah, on your yeah. list. Do you do a lot of TV? Is that something that you like no, to do? I haven't or done no? TV in a while. Okay. No, these are all things that come through. Um, you know, these days I I used to have direct direct game. Uh, company clients you know i'd work with sony or i'd work with uh activision or you know ea or all these different companies but when you asked me how things have changed one of the things i added was more translators have entered into the thing and and there's more money in the game industry back when i when i was doing these fun creative translations it was like um there was no one doing translations for one thing. There was no one looking at translations being done for one thing. It's like, it was, it was just so new that it was like the wild west and I could step in there and be a creative force adding 
writing writing interesting text and nobody was going to say you know hey what you know hey this isn't in the original where did you get this or you know the the examples are are all over the place right right you know, whether it's what is a man <laughs> you know right that's not classic. anywhere in there right it's a classic but well and unfortunately konami fucking removed it yeah, from the latest right, version right you know and 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 it, it it brings up the larger question of like what are we what is the role of a localizer and and these days you know all these fan subbers there's a lot of i think conversations and arguments about how it should be approached and is this censorship or don't change things or you know right but you know back then it was like well there's a japanese game we're creating an american game the american people are only going to be seeing the American game. And so whatever they see, that's the game content. Right. That's their and game. That's their game. So whatever that, com- you know, whatever they see is their game. And, and, and on top of that, it should be added that, you know, like what I said before about the, uh, a translation becoming colorless mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and needing to add color back to it. So if you want to give someone content that is enjoyable, you have to write enjoyable content. Translation is not a process where the, generally speaking, that where the where the content you can't separate the the linguistic, the Japanese, the linguistic um, style from the content. It's interesting because it's written in a, in a certain style, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So you have to translate the style as well, but it, it doesn't translate well. So you, you need to add that color back, like I was saying, and, or replace it with something else. Right. It doesn't matter. I mean, you know, if you don't know the original thing, but you know, now people think that, Oh, you know, these Japanese creators that they're, they put them up there like, like they're gods or something like this, or that because you use the word Chan, you know, I call you, you know, Alessio Chan, you know, that's so different than just calling you Alessio. Right. You know, right. It's, it's like, there's some kind of magic in that, you know. Yeah. Japanese how dare culture. you change the words of this? Right. You know, I was getting some mythology. kind of direct access to the, you know, I want to know about Japanese culture. So, you know, don't call it a promise, call it a yakusoku. Right. And now we're talking about yeah. like <laughs> Persona and Shin Megami Tensei games, I feel yeah. like. But yeah. <laughs> Well, and so I, I did want to ask you, and just because I want to, I definitely want to respect your time. I did want to ask you. It's funny that you bring up sort of this, this, uh, these people that we mythologize. I didn't realize like you fucking worked with like Yu Suzuki, like uh, Igarashi, Ori, that uh, I, that other guy from Konami that we were talking. No, about. I didn't. No, no, I'm sorry, I did not. Well, you've worked on their projects though. Yes, and <laughs> and and I guess it raises the question, and I want to get the J Blau take on this. Uh, what do you think of people putting these people on pedestals? Like, what do you think of these like cottage industry foaming at the mouth fanboy podcasts, uh, dedicated almost obsessive compulsively to these like auteurs, quote unquote? Yeah, you don't want to know, <laughs> but I yeah. do. That's why I asked you. I think it's, I think it's, um, it's understandable in one sense because, but, um, you know, like you already know, it's, it's, um, it's a kind of a fet- it's a kind of fetishization, um, right. That comes from a place of, um, well, I don't know how nasty should I get about it? Oh, get it, real nasty. It, Cause I'm very, well, I'm very I mean, self-aware. You know, well, I'm, I mean, on one level, it's a kind of, um, it's a kind of low key racism, isn't it? I think that's right. definitely, that's a, a fair, I think that's a fair way to frame you know, it. On one level. On another level, it's kind of like, um, it's just the, it's just the phenomena where, you know, people, um, you know, feel that the, the, the thing that's mysterious is the most, you know, mm-hmm. it's like an unopened box versus, you know, an open box. And so it's this distance that, that, that people, they, they attribute things that don't belong to it. I mean, you know, these, these people are for the most part, not geniuses, Mm -hmm. even Kojima, you know, he's, he's very good at some things, but his greatest genius is in his ability to project himself as a genius. That's a, that is, 
the most profound read I think I've ever heard of Kojima, and I think you might be spot on. He's currently playing social media. You're totally right. Like a fucking game, right. You know, his social media is more like his games, his traditional games, than his games are. If you want to know what Kojima's most recent games are, it's Twitter. <laughs> right. That's much more like the original, you know, Police Knots, Snatcher, than his games are. Because his games, the things that people think of as Kojima games are right these incredible technical um gameplays game gameplay and uh and you know 3D you know graphics engines and stuff that that are being created by people that are very very good at what they do and that have nothing to do with Kojima himself mm -hmm. and that's why this mismatch that you alluded to before about um that you said I love to talk about <laughs> between narrative and gameplay um is most profoundly visible in you know things the, the metal the metal gear series where you've got this dialogue going on and on and on and on and you can imagine kojima he wants he has all these things that he wants to say and then he's got this team of you know three or four hundred people who built this incredible game playing vehicle mm -hmm. and he's like okay well where can i you know where can i put my text <laughs> you know? yeah right and so they don't necessarily seem to be comfortable with each other all the time i think right yeah i think essentially he's building uh an extremely luxurious fabergé egg that has a fucking mm. post-it note inside of it and i didn't say that yeah and, well, you know, and it's like I, a weird dichotomy even for this podcast because i think i mean shit uh we've been doing this podcast for like three years on and off and we're coming up on episode 100 which is why i'm super glad we were able to talk to you we just got done covering the original metal gear solid again just as sort of like a let's do like a remastered of our first season and like every single day i wrestle back and forth with like, do I love these games or do I hate these games? And like, how do we talk mm. about them with an audience that loves them? Mm. You know what mm. I mean? Yeah. And it's difficult. I don't know. I think it's difficult to talk about, uh, to talk about somebody who you think is simultaneously a genius and also over. Although, over uh, like I think Snatcher, you know, the Snatcher to me is a completely different animal. Right. Because it has no gameplay at all. Yeah. Essentially, it's a visual novel and with so a point and click. I think thing. I think Kojima's genius is in is in Snatcher. You see, Ko, who, who I think that's where you really see who Kojima was. I think Kojima is that uh, very very precise, detailed oriented guy who became very good at creating this. Um, what do you call that type of game? That play that type of game? Um, uh, like a like a, like a spectacle game. Choice. Oh, uh, adventure game, like a point and click adventure game. Yeah, like a point and click adventure game. He 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 was he was a genius at using these um, that particular system mm -hmm. for creating a sense a, a sense of a very very wide wide world where he had freedom. It was the confined limitations that he was able to manipulate like a wizard mm -hmm. in order to create like like the Jordan computer in Snatcher, you know. I think it's a very. There was no point. Google, then, but it, yeah. it gave you the feeling that you had uh, more freedom. But it was because of the limitations. But now that we have so few limitations, you know, we're focused on you know making hair follicles look realistic. <laughs> yeah, getting digital right. Norman Reedus as penis correct or whatever. Is right, that? right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. That the question becomes: well, What is Kojima a genius at now? And um, he makes some. Semi interesting, semi. I'm not going to use the word profound. I was going to say semi profound, but I don't even think it right. passes the semi profound. I think it it's more like the like like a high school level, you know, guy who read some Marshall McLuhan and makes some commentaries on media level profundity. Holy shit, Jeremy! I think I love you. I just need you to know. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to be too harsh, but, but <laughs> I, I want to I want to hear the too harsh after that. That's intense. <laughs> so. No, but you I think know, I, you're not wrong. I think I think right? if anybody you know, argues against that, I think uh, I don't know. I think what you're saying is very objectively obvious if you look at the material in question. I read I read amusing you know amusing ourselves to death 
when I was a very young man. You, have you read the book? I've not. Uh, Neil Postman. Okay. Yeah, read it. Amusing ourselves to death. And, okay. Yeah, amusing ourselves to death. I don't think that there needs to be much written on the media after you read that. You know. Okay. It's pretty much got it all. You know, and that was written I don't know, thirty forty years ago. Um. So no, I don't think he made any predictions about the future that were particularly <laughs> amazing. But like I said, I think that now he's playing a social media game that is more like the original point and click adventure than. Oh, that's a good way. Death yeah, that's a good way to put it. He's uh, oh. yeah, the curated drip feed of information is very yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's Apple esque yeah. or something yeah yeah. So nice. Well, so the last question I'll ask you. Um, and I'm 100% like, I just need you to know your resume reads like a list of my favorite games ever. Oh, and uh, I was very, I was very lucky. I was very lucky. I mean, shit, I would, I would say you were very lucky and also very talented. So I think it was a combination of uh, doing you 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 well what? and being in the right place. Since you're a fan, can I ask you what you liked? Um, I think the prof, I oh, mean, it's hard to describe the profoundly uncanny nature of the writing in silent hill 2 probably made like the biggest impact on me uh i think at mm. the age that i happened to be when i played that game um mm. i think I, like un- like i don't want to constantly bring these up but the original metal gear solid when i played that um definitely jumped out to me in a big bad way i mean i have cited that game as being why i got into filmmaking um just because of the way it was written um, as a matter of fact, like I, I write screenplays now because of the games that you've translated. Um, Those were the two games that I was given the most freedom and room. Nice. That's really good to know. So specifically also, those two games, Silent Hill 2 and Metal Gear. Yeah, I would also add the, uh, Cry of the Banshee, which nobody played. Yeah, what, what is on? What system is that on? I mean, I probably shouldn't ask you. It's on the iPhone. Know, but... It's not even on it anymore. Oh, fuck. It, we lost it to the, all of the iPhone yeah. updates. Blame fucking, uh, was it Xseed Games? or? Oh, uh, Jesus. Really? It was Xseed? Hey guys, Alessio again, just jumping in with a quick correction. Um, the name of the company is actually Axis Games, not Xseed Games. Uh, so once again, it's Axis Games, and it is, cry, it is Banshee's Last Cry, not Cry of the Banshee. Yeah, we were, we were trying to, my company was trying to buy it from um, Spike Chunsoft. Okay, okay. We got to buy it and 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 release it um, ourselves. Just you know, um, and we we got I don't know, outbid or whatever by those guys, and they bought the translation which I'd already finished. It was all done. Mm-hmm. They bought it part and parcel, and they released it without changing anything or even looking at. It, as far as I know, oh, wow. they did no marketing of it. They promised to release it on the. Um, Android as well, a promise that they broke. Mm-hmm. And so it just just it just shriveled up and died a miserable Jeez. death. But I it was like an entire novel. Oh my god. That, yeah, and I and I, I I it was the most writing I've ever done in my career. Um even outside of Dragon Quest Seven. <laughs> Dragon Quest, we had like twenty people. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, that's a, and we didn't know what different. we were doing. No, no, this was, you know, this was. I knew, I knew exactly what I was doing, and it was like, it was like, it was like translating a book. Um, so <clears throat> if I'm a good writer, it's in that. If I'm a bad writer, it's in that. <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> I'll have to seek it out. I have to see if somebody did a did a text dump or something. It's unfortunate that that mobile games. Um, Because we encountered this too with some of the games that we've been covering for the for the podcast, Um, some of these games just they don't get optimized with the constant iOS updates or whatever, and they just fall into a ditch and they're never seen again. Yeah, Um, and that's I think the biggest shame on games right now is just the lack of archiving. Um, Especially being like a film fan, it's like, dude, people are killing themselves to preserve some of these films and. Right, I just think in yeah. games, like we just churn out thousands of hours of game a, a year, and we just don't preserve anything. Right, but the other thing about Silent Hill and uh, Metal Gear, yeah, absolutely, was also that I was I was also in in the recording booth 
and had a very big influence on the recording. Yeah, I heard two things about that. I heard we, uh, having read uh, the Kojima code that Terry Wolf put together, uh, we got a nice chunk of information on that recording process. And then I, I, I'd watched just recently, I think it's The Great Debate on YouTube, cited you as being um, a force of good with all of the Konami uh, language uh, voiceover situation with the HD collection. So well, yeah, yeah. So that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Do you miss Do you miss directing in the voice booth? I totally miss it. Yeah, I was really good at it. That sucks. Have you Have you tried to? I mean, it doesn't suck that you're good at it. It sucks that you're not doing it anymore. Have you mm. ever tried to get back into that world? It's hard from Japan because, understandably, they don't really do English language dubs from Japan. Fair, fair. Did you so when we had Cam Clark on the show, and it's actually kind of interesting because he he essentially said everything that you have recently said on 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 our conversation tonight about um, the differences in voice acting back in the day as it stands today. He kind of made a lot of the same really? points that you just made about really? the translating. Like, like what he was just saying, like back in the day, it was like you'd see the same 20 people voicing everything. And now there's just oh. a tidal wave of voice yeah. talent. Um, right. And, right. and he was just saying that like, um, there's just so many people going around that it's a little bit of a different landscape. And I, I think uh, one of the things he did talk about that he did remember from the, the voice uh, recordings for MGS was um, dealing with a uh, Chris Zimmerman. And I'm assuming, yeah. I think you worked right alongside her, right? I was sitting next to her the whole time. That's awesome. I asked him if he remembered you, and Cam Clark told me that he could not recall you. So I apologize for that. Yeah, you know, they, they they couldn't see they couldn't see us, you know, from where they were. But um, it's so strange the way I've been like written out of that, right? Because I is my recollection that Chris was doing. She was doing. Tech, more like technical direction. So she'd be like, "Okay, we got a little buzz on that on that last beat. Can you give me that line again? Mm -hmm. You know, I think you you know you 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 kind of fumbled the M, you know, on the on the word. Can you give me that a little bit, right? Or we got a pop on that, you know? She did that kind of direction, and she did the kind of direction where she had like, you know, color coded like, you know, books. So she knew, okay, now we're going to scene one one two, right? And so she ran this the session in a very organized way, right? and was right on top of everything like technically and in a way that I'm not experienced that or good at in any way. The only thing that I could contribute was that I'd written every single line and read them all in Japanese and all in English. And so I knew it emotionally and, you know, in this like deep, deep way, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd heard every character, speak every line and i knew every inflection that was supposed to sort of be there yeah you knew all about and the love tuck eating contest right <laughs> i mean i made that up yeah you know? i love it um that's a standout moment that we talk about quite a bit when we when we cover that game yeah and i don't think and that's just another example of something that you know when they when they reviewed it they would say hold on it doesn't say anything about a muck tuck you know eating contest you know, he, the line's different. Mm -hmm. Like I, I made, I made Snake make a joke. You must be a real uh, thread in the muck tuck eating contest, right? Yeah. The, the the Japanese doesn't have a joke there like that. I'm assuming that you inserted the uh, that takes care of the cremation line as well. When uh... I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember that one. But you know, I certainly did the. Uh, you know, I'd be chopped up faster than. Yep. I, than a, you know the which, uh, infomercial. Which, you know, yeah, I love that line. Yeah. Great line, but it didn't make any fans in the Japanese community because, right? I'm just a freelancer. Right. Um, so did you have any hand in this line? My hand! <laughs> when Ocelot loses hand, his hand. Yeah, I think that was, that was a pretty direct translation. Very nice, but, um, very nice. Slamming the silver bullets into a greased gun was certainly not in the original, you know? Yeah, that's crazy. Cause I, so I, I uncovered kind of some conflicting... So there was like an interview that got published on Junker HQ, which is like a Snatcher fan site that I guess 
and this is going to sound like the nerdiest shit in the world, came from a website called neokobe.net, which is- No, I, I, know, I know all yeah. of that. I know him. He's a friend of mine. Right, right. So, Facebook. so in that interview, you uh, had mentioned that the US and the Japanese script were nearly identical, but now it sounds like that's not the case. What, in, uh, in Snatcher? Yeah, I get, no, in the, you, uh, the question was about Metal Gear Solid, I think, and it was in that interview that's on Junker HQ, and you had said that the, mm. that the scripts were fairly similar. Is, or are, are they radically different? Or are they in the same wheelhouse? What you mean? You mean, you mean uh, my translation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, except for you know a few a few examples. I mean, you know, if you look at the numbers of it, yeah, it's they're they're drops in the bucket. So there's no it's reason why the meltdown should have happened. On no, on the it's, it's only if you have the expectation that you know that you translate it like a machine with no sense at all that you're going to have these enhanced moments of trying to add, you know, I mean, I, what, what am I, I'm not, I'm not doing it for my ego. I'm just trying to make it fun. Right. <laughs> you, know, I'm trying to, you know, so. Yeah. That's a, that's a massive bummer. I think. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to even say about that, but anyway, going back to what I was saying. Yeah. So Chris was very technical in that. And I, and as you can see, I'm not shy about speaking. <laughs> so yeah. I, I made a, a lot of um, requests to the actors to, you know, read it with more this or more oomph or make it more angry or, you know, can you inflect on this word or, you know, all sorts of stuff. So I think that the actors that couldn't see us, they thought it was, they thought I was a Konami employee maybe. Gotcha. Or something like that. And you were freelance at this point, right? You were working as like a contributor. So I think they just didn't, Remember, these are people that they'd worked with Chris on like so many other things. Mm-hmm. So it was like a it was like a gang. All the voice actors and Chris, they all had worked together on many different anime and stuff like that. So I guess it shouldn't really be surprising that they don't remember remember me. But yeah, and Chris's spouse is the voice of Ocelot, I think, as well, or ex spouse. But you know, yeah, I mean, look at look at the um, the re recording of Twin Snakes. Yeah. And the sort of lack of um, charm, what charm of it? Yeah, it's uh, it feels very. I think we were not kind to Twin Snakes when we talked about it on this show. Uh, not only do the cutscenes feel extremely over the top, but like the voice acting is. I I would. It's, very, it's, it's uninspired and yeah, wooden. Isn't I would it? say a kind read of it is it feels like it's um. It's like a radio drama cast trying to recapture a movie or something. Like it just feels very stilted. Yeah. 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 Which is a, a bummer because so, it's like all the original voice actors. But the reason I was good at um, at voice directing was I had a very, um, I was very attuned to. Well, I have, a, I have a good ear for languages, I guess. So I, I hear I hear things well and I mimic things well. You know, my sister was was a a voice actress. You know that, right? Oh, I did not know that actually. Oh, my sister, Maddie Blaustein, look her up. Okay. She was the voice of, she was the voice of Meowth and Pokemon for six oh, years. That's amazing. She was the, the voice and she did many, many anime. She's a very, she's very, very well known. Oh, also it seems like she goes by another name, Kendra Bancroft, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. She used that word, that name. Nice. I see. I saw that you were actually credited as a voice as well. Uh, Jeremy, I think it was in shadow hearts. I did some, I did some voices. Sometimes. Did you, do you enjoy doing voice work? I do. <laughs> very, very nice. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. I, uh, I apologize that we went down a, uh, 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 a metal gear, uh, hole given our sort of our no. conversation before the interview. Not at all. Um, I wanted to ask you just to kind of get your, uh, your thoughts on where this rabbit hole should lead. So like we were talking to Terry, somehow we got in Cam Clark's ear, which is great. Terry is the one who kind of told us maybe we should reach out to you. Uh, if you were running like a Metal Gear fan podcast, uh, who would be at the top of your like must interview list? Like who would you, who do you, who do you think we should go after next? What are you trying to? Is there like a something profound that you're looking for? I mean, <laughs> I think so. Sort of the the I don't know the ethos of the show has always been 
we've gone through in book club style discussed every single game including offshoot stuff in chronological order from like the beginning to the end uh we're, mm -hmm. we're getting close to the end and uh in which case we like we've even done seasons talking about film influences on metal gear and Mm -hmm, essentially mm -hmm. games and stuff that other people who have worked on metal gear have gone on to do like other like yoji shinkawa stuff or junji ito since he was involved with pt we read some of his books um we've been doing a lot of like side stuff but i think for us it's been sort of cataloging the history of this game series and everybody who's put blood sweat and tears into it um and just trying to shine a light on people that aren't necessarily kojima or kojima mm -hmm. adjacent um so i don't know who do you who do you think has busted their ass the most for metal gear um, it would be hard to avoid uh saying um david okay that's good I, we're gonna try to meet david in person cam's gonna introduce us to him at a convention in seattle david's a great guy david is a david is a real a really good guy he's first of all he's he's very generous he's very genuine he can lay it on pretty thick with the, the 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 fake, you know, Hollywood stuff too, because he's lived in that world for a long time. But right. I think at its core, he's just a really, you know, a really good guy. You know, um, that's awesome. So, yeah, here's yeah. the screenwriter as well. I didn't realize that he had had his name he, on some of these. Yeah, he is. He is, and um, I think he's probably got just the right touch of bitterness <laughs> and separation <laughs> and separation from this whole thing although who knows now now he he may have a whiff that there's a future for for him and uh as snake yeah you know that's interesting now that it looks like uh, what's his face won't be coming back yeah that's interesting now that kojima's gone uh no, no kojima what's his face uh oh kiefer <laughs> sutherland yeah, now that Kiefer won't be coming, back, yeah. reprising his reprising his brilliant role. Do you know? You know do you know anything about that at all? Because we, it has been difficult for us to get any information on why that. Nah, I happened. just know that I just know that uh, that Kojima, you know, has always wanted. If there's you know if there's one thing that people should understand is that. Um, the, the the life life the, the the dream for Kojima was to to make a movie right right, right. and I've told, I've said this before in interviews that yeah. you know when when we did Metal Gear Solid and then he saw the the Japanese uh, subtitles and the English voices I think that was the highlight for him it was a, it was probably a great moment for him because it was the closest thing he had come at that point to creating a movie. Mm -hmm. Because you understand, when a Japanese person sees a movie, they see sub Japanese subtitles. Oh, right and, on, yeah, yeah, movie, right. So he had done that, and then that's what made him want to make the integral version. Gotcha. And it was in the process of doing that that he uncovered that there was differences that I had written in there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so from that point on, it was you know, I was out, and you know, and then I. I think you 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 got this process where which eventually ended up in uh, um, I will not uh, what was that fucking line that I'm trying to remember the funniest line I will not you know bury your sorrows to the oh yeah, yeah. I will not scatter your ashes yeah. to the winds or whatever uh. <laughs> I, will not, I will not scatter your your sorrows to the something I don't yeah know, you know, to the darkest the corner, corner of the earth or whatever it, it is oh i wish it was that good of mine it's not, <laughs> it's, not it's not anywhere near that good writing but right um and it's like what, yeah, one so of 12 lines or something that snake even says in that entire game yeah yeah so i think that and 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 now he's got this weird you know affinity for other b actors mm -hmm. i mean norman reedus mm-hmm why get so hung up on that dude uh, so the line is i won't scatter your sorrow to the heartless sea yeah, so like I wouldn't have let that line go. <laughs> I love it, and that's why I didn't work on anything after that because I would have said, "Yeah." I I tried to look up the um I looked up the Japanese for that one at one point, and predictably it was a direct translation. Oh no, because you can't arrive at that without a direct translation. It's such a bummer, man. Because I feel like, especially during the sixteen bit days of like the Super Nintendo, like translation was like 
wild now, man. Like if you look at Earthbound or if you look at like Final Fantasy, right? Oh yeah, man. Those those guys stuff. And now, but now, but there's there's a certain segment of people that will say that keeping that line as it was, and I'm gonna use the phrase "keeping that line," right. which is they're doing a direct translation. That somehow that get, that affords you a window into the mind of Kojima or the soul of Japanese culture in some way that translating it less directly would censor or remove. There are people that think that. Right. And I think that that circles right back into what we were talking about, which is that sort of like ethnic fetishizing, like the magic of the Orient kind of bullshit. Yeah. Like yeah. just perpetuates that nonsense. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, Jesus. I, <laughs> yeah, I know we could uh, probably spin in circles uh, forever. On and on about that, yeah. I, no. Well, it's been, it's been a great conversation with you, Alessio. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Like, seriously and genuinely, like, thank you for taking the time. And I've, I'm have i going gonna, gonna to end it. <laughs> I'm going to end it with this question. Uh, what is a localizer but a miserable pile of concerns, Jeremy? Mm. Um, I had to get my bad joke in there. Um, no, I really appreciate you taking the time 14 hours away, uh, from the future, no less. Um, and, uh, yeah, hopefully at some point soon we, our paths can cross again. And I, I just really value you sharing your insights and your history and doing another interview when you've got so many other fucking awesome, exhaustive wonderful interviews so i appreciate you well you made you, you made it a good interview it was interesting for me as well thanks that was an interview with jeremy Can, wait, wait 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 can gotta, he just explain gotta, what the stress card is and that's how we you gotta okay so um <laughs> i'm gonna try What's... to be as accurate as possible about this okay i did not witness this firsthand this was uh kind of barracks talk um i'm sure some cursory research would be either be able to either prove or disprove this this is such a twist in this episode but, uh, <laughs> so when i when i was when i was uh, in infantry school at uh, fort benning georgia um around 2007 oh my god he's naming names you guys there was about a, to become an expose uh, there was a uh, a program that was being undertaken to try to limit the amount of, uh, shall we say, uh, mental uh, illness-related issues, um, people going through uh, basic combat training. And uh, one of the ways they tried to do this was they issued the privates um, cards that they could pull out of their pocket if um, one of the uh, the instructors, one of the drill sergeants, was, uh, you know, being a little too uh, aggressive with them. Um, you know, cause when, when I went in officially, they weren't allowed to hit you. Um, <laughs> oh my God. um, I'm not going to say whether that <laughs> did or didn't happen, but officially they weren't allowed to hit you. They had to maintain a certain amount of space from you. They, you know, they couldn't, you know, like get directly in your face and yell like it was almost full metal jacket, but minus the choke yourself with my hand part. So it was like a semi metal jacket. Yeah, like mm. a, 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 a jacketed jacket, jacketed hollow point, if you will. Oh no! Yeah. So like, if the box and glove fits, you must. But equip. see, I uh, see. I was I was in infantry school. We didn't have the stress cards because you know they they treat people that are essentially you know tip of the spear a little differently than people that are going to be doing support or other types of work. So this program wasn't enacted where I was I was undergoing training. It was enacted at places like uh, Fort Leonard Wood and uh, uh, Fort Jackson. Was this like a red card that you would throw down? Yeah, in a it, was soccer match? it was essentially like a red card in a soccer match. You pull this thing out, and the drill sergeant had to give you some space. Um, now, apparently, this program was retired because it's uh, you know kind of ridiculous, right? And apparently it was brought back fairly recently, according to some of my, my Zoomer friends that went through uh, basic combat training fairly recently. Uh, so I guess, I don't know if this is just some new army stuff, if it's here to stay or not, but uh, that was hmm. that was the, uh, the news as it was relayed to me by the other unfortunates I, was, uh, I happened to be training with. Nice. And there's your answer, guys, on Military Gear Mondays. <laughs> mm-hmm. And as the world turned, so too was 
uh, that an interview with Jeremy Blaustein. <laughs> It was good, man. We're doing well. Uh, my favorite part of the interview, um, and Sam, since uh, this is weird that we're doing an outro that you guys haven't listened to yet, the actual interview, uh, <laughs> Jer- Jeremy, uh, at the end, I asked him who we should go to next. I was like, everyone has kind of organically led us to each other um, as far as the interviews go. I was like, who yeah. who, who, would you put at the top of your list if you... Uh, we're like the man in black looking for the maze. Right, right. Um and I, I don't want to scalp anybody, so I just ask him politely. Yeah. And, yeah. and Jeremy says, uh, I, th- I think David's the guy you should go talk to. And I was like, well, isn't that the damn truth? My, my, <laughs> my favorite part of the whole interview was when Jeremy asked Alessio, what are you trying to accomplish? It was pretty and, great. And I looked at him, and there was this look of just – Existential dread and like, just like panic, abject horror. Oh, yeah, right. I was like, eyes. "What, what and, am I and, trying to?" And, accomplish? And, and I was just like, "What? What are we trying to accomplish? <laughs> what why, is a man? Why are we? But here? a miserable. <laughs> what is a man? <laughs> a miserable pile of secrets. Jesus, I am uh, unfortunately keeping my wife awake when she's trying to go to sleep for a business trip. I bet. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was good. I, I thought my answer was pretty good. No, your answer was great, but it was the momentary oh, yeah. look of... When the of, Pink Floyd started playing in my brain. When the mm. when the acid hits, <laughs> you were just... Yeah. I mean, it was it was beautiful. I wish you could have seen... I wish you could see you, see you through my eyes as I see you. It was like the, the Requiem for a Dream uh, quick cuts of the pupils expanding. I won't, I won't scatter your existential terror to the... To the <laughs> This what was <laughs> to it? the heartless to the heartless sea, <laughs> dude. Jer- Jeremy, we probably should have thrown a trigger warning at the beginning of this. Uh, trigger warning. This is a trigger warning. Yeah. If you have listened to this trigger warning, <laughs> you are now being triggered by the trigger warning, dude. Jer- Your triggering yeah. at this trigger oh, warning God. has triggered me, I'm, and it, you will be notified of this trigger at the beep. Yeah, I'm triggered. Uh, pew pew. Jeremy just he he dug until he hit. Rock bottom and kept on digging. <laughs> mm. I uh, I just wanted to throw this out there. My favorite part of the interview was, and then Alessio, if you could go back through all of the episodes of the podcast and just clip. Just piece it together. Yeah, just take my words and turn them into. Um, oh, man. Then, now i got to find places where I think you were talking about Jeremy Blaustein. I'm sure I could just yeah. go back to the I Kojima Code episode. I think Jeremy Blaustein is very sexy. There we go. James did yeah. it for us. That's fine. Perfect. Yeah, no, that's fine. No so more you just use that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Nice. But yeah, um, I think all that remains is for us to thank everybody. Thank you, James, for being here and present. On, thank you on for, for having me. Your presence is the present. Aw. That's uh, why we call it the present. Aww. Sam, thank you for um, making me feel good going into the Jeremy interview because I was pretty nervous. Yeah, um, I like I like to hype I like to hype my friend up. <laughs> my boy, you my boy, Blue. Um, uh, real quick, I'm just gonna pit you guys against each other. Each other. Uh, James said that Gladio is the best boy, uh, and I think Sam thinks Ignis is the best um, boy. It's fucking Iggy. Ch- what are you doing? Childhood is liking Ignis. Adulthood is realizing that Gladiolus makes more sense. Yikes! No. For the record, he has not played no. episode Ignis yet. None so. are so blind as those who cannot see. And particularly, yep, yep. particularly <laughs> the one that never gets his eyesight back. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. You, why don't you play episode Ignis and then come and talk to me about being an? Why don't you loving. bathe yourself in the waters of Lake, Lake Minnetonka. Minnetonka? Lake Minnetonka. I love it. Jesus Christ, this is great. Um, but yeah, I guess all that remains is for us to uh, say sayonara. Um, I think Jeremy would approve of that. Maybe, maybe not. He'd probably frown on all of this, actually. Um, Mm-hmm. But it's all, like he's here with us in spirit, right? Okay. Oh um, from the future, because I talked to him and it was Wednesday. Put that morning. thing away, Sam. But here it's Tuesday night, so he was telling me about the future. Um, the future is now, old man. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. but yeah, all, all that remains is for us to one hundred percent thank the patrons. Without you guys, we wouldn't be doing this, and without you, we wouldn't have the money to afford the software that we recorded the interview with, um, which is specialty stuff. So thank you. Um. If you want to patronize, you can uh, hook us up. Patreon.com slash Metal Gear Mondays. As little as a dollar a month. It gets you access to our Discord and a discount 
code for our merch shop. I actually am wearing a Metal Gear Mondays t-shirt as we speak that I've procured from the merch shop that Sam Wright designed with his hands. Hey. Um, and they're pretty good. This is a comfortable shirt. James, does this, does this look okay on my fat stomach? Well, number what? number one, are my nipples bleeding you, through? You are a friendly skeleton. I cut the nipples, and you have out. always been a friendly skeleton. <laughs> friendly skeleton. <laughs> I've never been. So never that, been is, called that, in my that life. is that is a lie from the devil. I love. Don't, you, don't I love you dare it. call yourself fat. Second, this that is, is a, a form. That fitting. is a perfectly acceptable T-shirt. It's got <laughs> great stitching. Um, he's I, touching. I he's note, touching. Me. I note the lack of a, uh, a tag, which is excellent because yeah, those, is the best. those trigger my uh, my sensory awareness. Oh, no. mm. um, yeah, I got to say, you know, know, over overall, uh, ten out of ten would wear. Nice. You heard it from the man himself. Also, for as little as two dollars a month on Patreon, um, you get access to our <laughs> Patreon only podcast uh, as well as episodes early. So, like some people got to listen to Cam Clark and uh, Jeremy Blaustein and. Terry Wolf, uh, like fucking weeks in advance. So you should do that. Yeah. Um, also, let's plays at different levels and all kinds of other fun stuff. So yeah. Um, um, look, real talk. If you can't afford two dollars a month, what are you doing with your life? Oh no. You're probably listening to this uh-huh. podcast. You should leave us an iTunes <laughs> review if you don't have two dollars, because that's yeah. helpful too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know what to do with that. I'm pretty sure he just personally attacked, like, I know exactly two people. Yeah, who've been come, wanting come to at, Come at me, bro. Who've been, who, what are you, what, what you, you going to do? Not pay my friends money like you were already doing? Oh, shame shame no. on you. Shame oh, on no. you. Oh, don't shame them. Yeah, they're good people. Oh, no. Don't, don't, I will ring that bell. No, oh, no. That bell has been rung. Yikes. Um, All right. Very cool. Sam, where can people ring-a-ding, find you online? Ring a ding ding, baby. Fuck it. <laughs> Sam, where can, where can people find you online? <laughs> they can find, they can, <laughs> Sam's dying. They can yeah. find me on Twitter at Sandrel. That's S A N J U U L. And then I would also be remiss if I did not mention Instagram at Metal Gear Mondays, where uh, lots of fun stuff happens. Yeah, where the real magic comes in. The real magic comes comes to life. Nice. Uh, people can find me at AC Summerfield on Twitter or acsummerfield.com. Um, I even got to talk about some film work with Jeremy. That was nice. Um, I know uh-huh. you're not supposed to talk about yourself in interviews, but I find that it makes people feel closer. So It wasn't an it. interview unless it was a casual, casual conversation uh, with our friend Jeremy Blast. <laughs> you're right. He did say at the end of the interview, see you on Facebook. So I guess yeah. we're Facebook official friends now. Thank you, Jeremy. Yay. Uh, James, where can people find you on the internet? Or do you not want to be found? <laughs> um, well, unfortunately, you can't find me on the internet because I'm one of those uh, neo luddites that rejects all forms of social media. But mm-hmm. um, I wish if I you would that. like to support um, a venture which I am a part of, um, check out uh, NuggetFest.com. It is a uh, uh, meetup of people um, who partake in the uh, weapons forum on uh, 4chan.org. Um, great people, a uh, lot of lot of guns, a lot of Metal Gear Solid enthusiasts, and it's weird you, how those things come together. And if you and if you yeah. show up, you'll get to see my, uh, you know, pretty pretty good Naked Snake cosplay. Um, I've been wearing that Ooh. thing around for a few years, and that's just how people know me. So I can't wear anything else, or no one will know who I am. So yeah, if you uh, if you uh, show up to Nugget Fest um, and you see a guy dressed as Snake um, come up and tell me how I ruined your favorite podcast and uh, I will I will probably give you a beer I, uh, I'm not gonna lie that sounds cool I was kind of hoping it was about like chicken nuggets <laughs> I'm not, I'm well, not, I'm uh, not no, lie. well the, the reason it's called Nugget Fest is because the uh, our, our, our emblematic weapon is the Mosin Nagant, which, oh, uh, yeah. if you'll recall, is the sniper rifle used by the end in uh, Metal Gear Solid 3. James, do you know who you're well, talking to right now? Um, yeah, come the fuck on. Well, I just wanted to put it in a, in a context <laughs> that you know, no, you, I know you guys would appreciate. We're Josh on your, on your show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's a bunch of weapons and anime enthusiasts, so you're going to have like people... Uh, you know, firing a squad automatic weapon um, while carrying around a waifu dakimakura. So uh, yes. it's it's just like a convention for a bunch of insane uh, 
weeaboo weapon enthusiasts and and we just shoot all day and we drink all night for a weekend it's 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 incredibly fun all the de- all the de- like a, all the details like a, are on the website uh it's nuggetfest.com and like like a barnes courtney song we shoot all day <laughs> drink all night stay up yeah. by the tv light oh, oh i think that's how it goes <laughs> I'll have to take your word for that. I I don't I don't yeah. listen to uh, I don't listen to hip hop. <laughs> this is certainly not. I hip-hop. love it. I love it. This is amazing. The dry humor is like my skin is dried out, y'all. I gotta go better uh, better rub <laughs> gotta get that rub lotion, lotion on that. Oh Ashy. no! Come on, Ashy Larry. Jesus Christ. Ah. Anyway, on that note, um, uh, James, you're the guest of honor. Uh, can you figure out how to get how to get to the point where one of us says it's just a box? Because that's where we have to be to end the show. Isn't that where we're all living? Just a box. That's I'll, that's acceptable. We've been doing this for 111 episodes, so I'll just give it to you. Fuck it. You know, you know, uh, in, in Deus Ex, they say that the uh, Illuminati is just a box within a box. Why don't you go think on that on the tree of woe? Just a box. 